The death toll continues to climb in Beirut, where an explosion of more than 2,700 tons of ammonium nitrate rocked Beirut last week, killing more than 200 people and leaving 300,000 people homeless. Paul Musgrave, assistant professor of political science at UMass Amherst, spoke with us on what's happening in Lebanon and on continued protests and concerns in Hong Kong after China enacted a new national security law. Well, it has been a, a dramatic week, 10 days since the explosion. Uh, probably the most important thing politically is that the government has resigned, which means that they're now a caretaker government. Um, which means that, ironically, they are less well-placed to make any of the changes that protesters have been demanding in response to the explosion, in response to everything that's happened. Uh, they're now just a caretaker. They can't do anything. Of course, the most pressing humanitarian challenge is the fact that the port having been destroyed means that it's very, very difficult to get food into the country of Lebanon. And that's not just an issue for the people who live in Lebanon, for the Lebanese people themselves. It's also an issue for the one, more than 1.5 million refugees from Palestine, from Syria, who live in Lebanon, uh, who are now, of course, unable to get food. And also for people in Syria themselves, because the port of Beirut, it turns out, has been and one of the ways that the humanitarian pipeline has gotten supplies into Syria. So there have been protests, there have been uh, demands even uh, somewhat outrageously for the international community to bypass the Lebanese government and to take direct control of the situation there. But overall, it has just been a tumultuous time. Um, this is a country with extremely complex politics, where from almost a year they've been in the middle of huge protests and now with COVID and everything else the country is suffering its worst economic crisis even before the explosion. So it, it is just an amazing and very sad time for a great country. And you mentioned a little bit about the refugees but there's also in Beirut itself more than 300,000 people who are homeless, more than 200 people who have been killed, you know, uh, so many more uh, who are missing. If you go back to October, you had mentioned uh, other protests that had been continuing because of the economic um, crisis there. Can you explain a little bit about uh, the makeup of the government and what uh, part Hezbollah plays within the government structure? So as you may know, Lebanon is comprised mostly of three major ethnicities. There's the Maronite Christians, Sunni Muslims, and Shiite Muslims. And Divisions within those communities led to the Lebanese civil war, which lasted for 15 years and is why a lot of people still like automatically refer to this as war-torn Lebanon. Well, those divisions continue in the government where the president, prime minister, and speaker of the Lebanese legislature all come from one of those groups. And these are people who primarily gained power during the civil war. They're practically warlords. And back in October 2019, as the economy was faltering, the government tried to introduce new taxes. This set off widespread revolts, protests uh, that kicked off what's called the October Revolution, in which the people were rising up against this, what they view as the corrupt power elite. There's also a sense that the power elite uh, is too closely involved with Hezbollah, a terrorist armed militant group with close ties to Iran uh, that many people say might have had a role, and this is pure speculation, in stockpiling the ammonium nitrate that was at the port that caused that giant explosion. And so there's this really complex situation in which the two sides are now trading accusations of each being controlled or duped by foreign influence. Uh, Hezbollah has said that they had nothing to do with this, but a lot of people on the streets are not taking that seriously. So this was a country that was, if you'll forgive the pun, already in a combustible situation before this explosion. And the explosion has only exacerbated the strains and the tensions that we've seen before. And you know, a couple of days ago, many government buildings were occupied by protesters. The government chased them out, used their troops to chase them out. But clearly things are at a precarious and volatile time right now in Beirut. And it certainly makes it difficult and complicated for the international community to respond. And, and how, and how uh, will they respond or have they been responding? Well, it's going to be very difficult. Um, there was a French-led summit over the weekend which raised $300 million in relief. Uh, that's a lot, obviously, and French President Emmanuel Macron has been very visible in 
leading relief efforts. He actually visited Beirut and he was mobbed by supporters. Um, he's not the most popular guy in the world, so that was a little bit surprising. Um, but that's well short of the $15 billion in reported damage that Beirut sustained. And the United States has not been playing its usual role as a convener and mover of aid, partly because uh, the Trump administration is so suspicious of the United Nations and multilateral institutions that it's just not going through the normal uh, routes that you would want to go through to handle a catastrophe of this magnitude. So I would say that it's mixed, but not quite as, as hopeful as we'd want. And of course, the background condition for all of this is the COVID-19 pandemic, which just complicates everything tremendously uh, in terms of coordinating and managing a humanitarian effort. And let's move uh, right now to Hong Kong, where, again, there's there's some other um, issues going on there as well, including Chinese new national security law. I know that they had arrested um, a media mogul uh, recently. Tell me a little bit about what's going there and, and the implications for that. Well, when China, when China took uh, Hong Kong in 1997, there was a provision in the basic law and the provision in the handover document that eventually Hong Kong would have to accede to a law by which Beijing could enforce certain national security provisions to make sure that Hong Kong wouldn't be a major threat to Beijing and the People's Republic of China. That never got passed. They could never get it through the Hong Kong legislature, which has been feisty and pro-democratic and cautious or even opposed to the rule of the Communist Party of China. Well, they finally got that through. Um, it's been kind of a corrupt deal. Many people in Hong Kong um, have been dissatisfied with this or upset with this. Um, there were, of course, protests all through the first part of this year. That law has been passed under the auspices of this law. Um, the Communist Party, the PRC, and Hong Kong's government have moved quickly to silence and extinguish opposition. Um, probably the most visible aspect of this has been arresting Jimmy Lai and uh, storming the newsroom of his newspaper, Apple Daily. This has been one of the focal points for democratic contention for resistance to Beijing's rule in Hong Kong. And it's really been one of a series of measures of arrests and surveillance that have showed that Beijing is not committed to maintaining one country, two systems. And many observers are saying that one country, two systems, the rubric by which Beijing would continue Hong Kong's democratic British institutions uh, is basically over. So. Um, this is really jarring and it's been really sudden uh, and it's very sad to see a democracy kind of being extinguished by Beijing. And that one party, two systems is supposed to last until 2047? It was supposed to last for a long time. That's right. 50 years from the handover. OK, and those protests have been going on uh, again since uh, since last year. You know, again, uh, people calling, um, you know, on China being corrupt and, and encroaching on those rights that they have enjoyed in Hong Kong. Yeah, and that's been something that has mobilized Hong Kong's protesters from uh, the Umbrella Movement eight or ten years ago um, through last year. And, you know, Hong Kong, they've even had their elections uh, for local legislative councils postponed by a year using COVID as a cover. Um, but I think that it is fair to say that when you have an election for a legislature postponed for a year in these circumstances, you really have to wonder if those elections will ever be held again. Um, it, the, the folks that are on the ground there, they are actually not being critical because at this point it is so dangerous to be critical of Hong Kong that you risk, uh, you risk arrest if you're critical of the government, if you're critical of Beijing. Um, and so we've seen this vibrant political culture just stamped out um, almost overnight.